Black me brown me white. Nasty Babylon stripe, you mad, yeah man. Don't try to resist this metamorphosis. Right yourself with Iman Black. Listen to Iman. Step aside, slash ya. This is Marogini. Salut, Monsieur, Madame. Vous êtes en train d'écouter Metamorphosis avec Dr. Iman Black. People moving out, people moving in wild because of the color of the skin. Run, 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 but you sure can't hide.
outside. The metamorphosis is here, it's live. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, word, sound, and power. Music, drumming, current affairs, everything to grow and lift up your mind. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, creating beauty and stimulating change from a constant supply of relevant knowledge and information. No more youths and youths for sale. We get wise and don't decide to change their style. Bobby Rock, keep your empty promises and your crooked smile. Metamorphosis, come with your thoughts. Change your way of thinking. Metamorphosis, the change begins with you. You, 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 you. Black men of Tarsus, black men of Ethiopia, Timbuktu, Alexandria, gave the light of civilization to this world. Ethiopia shall stretch forth our hands unto God, and princes shall come out of Egypt. I am I, soft moves thy jaw, rust for I. Keep listening. Mighty and thunder, a big sea of the Yamasa band, the Maui Rasta, the Madan Yalam, the Yistle. 
Nice to learn. Nice to learn. Welcome to Metamorphosis. This evening is I and I, Osaim Wese Osagboro, sitting in for Dr. Iman Black and the Metamorphosis this evening. Welcome to all the ones in the whole world. Tonight we're going to focus on Ethiopia. And the program we subdivided in what we call seals. Seal one, seal two, and seal three. Tonight we bring forward the notion of Ethiopia and center it. And at this time, in the psyche of black people worldwide, especially the Rasta man in Jamaica, and especially those people of African descent in the diaspora, this word taken from academia by black people from Jewish beginnings to disperse and address the notion of dispersed people. So because black people dispersed all over the world and during the time of enslavement, Ethiopia became a focal point that drew people together inexorably towards the notion of redemption. So this is the focus tonight. So why are you like man black? Why man black in a country? Somewhere in Westmoreland or St. James. We want to hear all the people them in Portland who listen to Metamorphosis. We want to hear all the people them in the world for tune in tonight. Because we depend on a tradition of edutainment. And we're going to focus on the edu tonight. Which is really to draw out of people the ideas and talents that they have inherently printed in them DNA when them born and black people being the creators of the world the earth as we will see as we try through tonight there's no doubt in my mind that you will learn so I want to say yell the item tonight still in tonight still in tonight still in and tonight still in is an Ethiopian word and we have to focus on that and every night when you tread in into metamorphosis is a new beginning a new learning. So again, we want to yell all the ones in Portland. St. Margaret's be a buff, be a bone broke right here. All the different communities we're all over the world where black people are tuning in now. And when you look upon sometimes the map, upon the airwaves, you see where people are tuning in and are listening to the sounds of metamorphosis. So again, we say good night. And it's a seal one, seal one going to be called from ancient Ethiopia to Menelik. Menelik, the second to be exact. Because this man, this warrior, this man defeated a European power. He's not the first African king to defeat a European power. But this is one of the many African leaders who defeat a European power. Menelik did much to modernize and bring into focus Ethiopia on the world stage by courting a lot of the Europeans and by bringing in technology and weaponry so that when he found foul play among the Europeans as normally they do, he had to defend his country and defeated Benito Mussolini. I hope no one remember that man, Benito Mussolini, defeated the Ethiopian. And so defeated the Italians, I mean. And so that's the first seal. The next seal now is going to be called the influence of Ethiopia on Pan-Africanism and Rastafari. And we're going to see how even before Rastafari became a world leading focus, a world force, we when to look and see how the notion of Ethiopia and I'm a, I want to them to focus because when the program started here, Marcus gave his voice and him said, Ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto God. Princes and kings shall come out of Egypt. And we're going to look at that. And the final seal, when we call Ethiopia's gift to the world, the Ethiopian World Federation, an organization started in 1937 by His Majesty as a gift to the world to people of African descent, to promote development, community development through social work and volunteerism. 
and it was it was given and twin with the United Nations. The United Nations gave sanction to the Ethiopian World Federation. It is still alive because all over the world, the Ethiopian World Federation actually began in New York. And the charters have spread. And the charter, one charter is still alive today in Jamaica. There were many charters. And the charters are given the name locals. So tonight I'm going to be speaking in a way on behalf of local 43 for which i am presently the public relations officer so we have a lot to share with the item tonight about ethiopia and how ethiopia is being refocused and i made a little error i say many lick defeat uh, mussolini is not mussolini mussolini was a soldier in the army that Menelik defeated. His Majesty defeated Mussolini. So we want to correct because we don't want to mislead anyone, you know. Menelik II. Menelik II, descendant of Menelik I, who was Menelik I was the son of Solomon and Sheba. And that began the line of the Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia. So you see all the Bible readers tune in, you know. Because you're going to hear things you never hear before. Because Ethiopia is mentioned so many times in the Bible. And Ethiopia gave the rise to the ancient Egyptian civilization. So these things, we're going to investigate, we're going to insulate, and we're going to ensure that the item get good knowledge. Because you know what? Uh, you know, this time, you know, information alone is not enough, you know. The one you might forget what we call knowledge. And we did we distinctly use the word in you know, a no ledge. Because we want to deconstruct words for people to know what they mean. So when we start, we're going to go through and the one of go find them books and find some pencil and find some paper because you know what? Uh, some important information I will share what people need to know. Because every time something is taught, it don't remain taught all the time, you know. We have to revisit it because you know every year we visit Christmas and we visit Easter and we revisit all of these things constantly. And every morning you wake up here, you look at devotionals on the radio every single day. So people of African descent, sometimes we have to refocus you. Know? And this time Rasta people is especially, especially the young Rasta them who walk up and down every day and I dig out them and make and feel that this Rasta far eye. We have to hear more. Especially since the word Ras and Tafari originate in Ethiopia. Ras meaning head, Tafari meaning the power of the Trinity. And when His Majesty was brought into the, the, the leadership of, of Ethiopia, he became highly Selassie. So I want the, the item now for focus, sit back, listen for the next couple of minutes because it's not long enough. Three hours to be a couple of minutes because. We are there from 500,000 BC. We are there from 6,000 BC. 6,000 BC are when Egypt really declined as a civilization, as a world civilization. So if we have to look beyond 6,000 BC and go back to 500,000 BC and even before Egypt into ancient Ethiopia, as the ancient Greek historians were to find out. So this is it, black people. Black people in America, black people in Russia, black people in Poland, even in Japan, kind of black people there in Japan nowadays for some exchange program. Even more one data, Yale Makela, if you are listening to it. And so we have to go all over the earth, especially in North America and South America, and especially in Brazil now where my favorite game I was start, and Dr. Iman Black as an international coach, where many black people live in Brazil. And they were even speaking the other day about how the black people in Brazil are really the, the blood and the sweat and tears of Brazilian civilization, and only to find themselves being marginalized. Also, probably it has ended or near ended. But there's a major exhibition in Ethiopia called The Majesty and the Movement. So you see, Ethiopia is in sharp focus 
right now and today also i see it on the news where today is the anniversary of what they call d day where they, this european they may have a have a civil war where them turn and call it into a world war and because they were the colonial masters of the world they dragged the rest of the world into this so-called civil war which turned out to be a world war so, so today them say is the anniversary of the defeat of this worldwide um dictator murderer mass murderer infamous adolf but black people where did you fall into all of that carnage and and, and where are we turning around and heaping even carnage on our own people in kenya in nigeria in sudan all over where we have despotic leaders who are leading our people ast astray where and developing them and dragging them into and i use the word drag as not something derogatory but to drag them and shepherd them into development we are destroying them and letting Europeans know further fulfill their narrative that you see them black people there. They really can't rule themselves, you know, see? Them independent and look what they do. So, we want to hear some sounds. Burning spear, raw pizza, and give you two sounds. You take us away from Africa with you just our culture. The good for the post by and say, humble yourself, my little one, humble yourself, my children, humble yourself. Oh, my brother, As we said, tonight's still in, tonight's still in, tonight's still in. And there are many people, you know, when they think about Ethiopia, they they really remember some negative images. And these days too, when many, many people think about Ethiopia, they think about runners. But we're going to come to the runners eventually, down later into the program. But we want to start with, where did Ethiopia 
the idea the name the term the word if you want to call it that come from because many people contend that the name ethiopia was once the whole continent and it has now been if you want to call it dwindled down to africa but the term ethiopia was first used by ancient greek writers in reference to central african kingdom that they believe not only be to be culturally and ethnically linked to ancient egypt but was the source of that civilization and you hear that black people ethiopia as the source of the civilization of egypt because many people do not realize that ancient ethiopia predates i will use the word ancient twice ancient ethiopia predates ancient egypt and as according to the greeks now the civilization of europeans that were visiting africa a lot they found and they wrote a lot because like africans who were writing now people ancient ethiopians and ancient egyptians had their own language that they wrote with characters ah ooh, e, ah, uh. those are some of the characters of the Ethiopians. but so contrary to popular belief now the term was not exclusive to present landlocked ethiopia according to greek writers ethiopia was an empire originally situated between tasseti in lower kemet and the confluence of the white and the blue nile so the nile river remember you know it flows and we have the white nile and the blue nile and ethiopia was around that part however the name became synonymous with much larger region that included present day countries now listen to this ancient ethiopia or kush or abyssinia included south sudan present day ethiopia eritrea Djibouti, somalia kenya uganda central african republic chad so big big empire so it is not by by mistake that ancient egyptian sages and scholars travel out of egypt of ancient ethiopia and built egypt ethiopia is an english transliteration of the greek word ethiopia which originates from the greek word itipos which literally means charred or burned and it is in fact composed of something that means i burn some greek symbols and literally transferred into face or complexion so you see when europeans know because we don't have any access to hieroglyphs our people in the west have not deciphered and cannot read hieroglyphs so our reference point is english and the english that we are used to is 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 a mash and i use the word mash of so many different languages with its root in germanic tradition that we know in the west because we are colonized and enslaved and our brain washed out we get the english so we have to use it we can't escape it so prior to greek history now ethiopia was known as kush people even refer to them as kushites ethiopia was known as kush in in and it's date from the reign of a pharaoh called seti in 1294 to 1279 bc and the region refer, was referred to as kash or kush and in other texts between 1550 to 1069 bc so you see people in our earth ethiopia is so ancient that people refer to it in text the greeks wrote about it because the Greeks now, you know, in order to build them civilization, them borrow, them borrow heavily from ancient Ethiopia. And then I use the word later from Egypt. Because Egypt never just rise out of the dust or the sand and then establish. The region known as Kush was inhabited for several millennia. Museum and people out there this is some serious research that has been done so that the information can be shared with you this wasn't just googled 
we have to read several sources. And I want to encourage the item now as black people because here we are. Some black people excuse knowledge by saying them don't like read. I hope the youth them were going to school and I want to heal up Romario and this from Wilmers who just heal me. I want to heal up the youth them who figure say them go to school and tell us them don't like read. When I grew up, I hear them say, if you, if you want to hide something from black man, where you put it? In a book. All them things they are insult to me, you know. Then if you want to hide something from black man, you put it in a book. So here was a whole heap of research that has gone into it. So we said the region that we now know as Ethiopia was known as Kush. And many scholars will tell you that it was the whole continent of Africa that was one known, one time known as um, Ethiopia. So we say the researchers have found that places in, in Sudan had thousands of years of history. And they find all kinds of what we, we archaeologists call artifacts, axes, stones, dating back 70,000 years. As early as 13,000 BC, they found several practices taking place, ceremonial practices in different parts of present day Sudan dating back to what they call the Kadan period of 13,000 to 8,000 BC. Now listen, there are some people who say the earth is 6,000 years old as a reference to the Bible. Now, this, the, the, this I tell you about 13,000 BC. So Bible scholars, how are you going to tell the church members who listen tonight that 13,000 BC actually existed? What kind of reference point are you going to make? And I want everyone all over the world, you know, listen. And if you can send in some text, you send in some text. And so we can even read and even further develop our knowledge. So archaeologists now have uncovered many tombs where animals were domesticated. And, and, and animals sometimes, because in those days, and even today, you still have nomadic tribes that value cattle very highly because they were the source of all different kind of either whether it's nutrients or skin or different parts of their bodies was used circular tomb was placed above the ground and they found the beginnings of ceremonial burials and there are other sites too found in ethiopia and sometimes in ancient history the word Ethiopia and Egypt were used synonymously. They were used synonymously because Ethiopians gave right. And people, you have heard it before. I am black and I am and I've said it at enough time. Ethiopia gave rise to ancient Egypt. And there were even other sites too at El Gaba. They found Neolithic rocks. And in modern day Ethiopia, they found strains of dynastic Egypt. So, they are telling you now that they have found all kind of things. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew history now, the Torah, which is part of the Old Testament, mentions Ethiopia. In the Bible, now, I don't see the European country mentioned in the Bible, but there's a different discourse. We're not going to take on that today. The Bible mentioned Ethiopia in one of its oldest books, Genesis, in chapter 2, 14,000 B.C., and puts Ethiopia in a geographical location. And it says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is that that compassed the whole land of Ethiopia. The whole land of Ethiopia. So, Bible readers, when you go to church Sunday, ask your pastor. Ask your pastor if it's the same Ethiopia they're talking about today. Because if he can't answer that, then you have to go read some more. It goes even further. In the book of Numbers, dated 1200 BC, it says Moses was born and educated in Egypt and married an Ethiopian woman. And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. And they never liked this. So you see, we are come from ancient Ethiopia. We are show you where it starts. We are show you develop. 
where I show you all of the archaeological evidence that is there to prove that ancient Ethiopia is a place of antiquity from as early as what? 70,000 BC and it's mentioned in the Bible and we're going to look at some more because people you need to go and, and observe because there was even a king of ancient Ethiopia that saved Jerusalem it's in the Bible listen to this Ethiopia's king, king Taharka who also ruled Egypt from 690 to 664 Ethiopia's king who ruled Egypt from 690 to 6 to 664 BC in the 25th dynasty is mentioned in the Hebrew text as having saved Jerusalem from Assyrian destruction in Isaiah chapter 37 verse 10 to 11 because you know you know you see when you're growing up as a youth like me in Jamaica now in the 70s and before people used to quote the Bible so freely that you wonder how them know the Bible so well some of them never even finish university or high school so this is a very very important thing and this says and when he heard say of Tiharka king of Ethiopia behold he is come this come out of the Bible you know people this come out of the Bible behold he is come out to fight against thee he sent messages unto hezekiah saying thus shall he speak to hezekiah king of judah saying let not this is taharka speaking to the people you know he said let not thy god in whom thou trustest deceive thee saying jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of assyria so here is an ethiopian king coming to defend egypt and you know people seem seem picture there you know? Same picture there in, in the Bible, but for the first time you are seeing his picture, King Taharka. So, so and 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 the Ethiopians and the Egyptians were mentioned synonymously in the Bible, and we have to look at that. And some of you only know Homer, a Greek historian. The Greeks had a tendency to just keep traveling to and from Egypt, you know, traveling to and from Egypt. As a matter of fact, many Greeks went to Egypt and Ethiopia to go to school. That's where they learned their philosophy and their logic and developed their science. The Greeks go to Ethiopia and Egypt because the pyramids that are built and learn geometry and trigonometry and then ascribe to, ascribe to themselves now this knowledge and then present themselves to the world as the bedrock of European civilization. There's a few other nations are mentioned in ancient European literature as much as Ethiopia. Few other nations are mentioned as much in European literature as ancient Ethiopia. And fewer are held as highly as Ethiopia. Ethiopians are first mentioned in the oldest of Greek texts. Homer, the, some, the book called Homer Iliads, as a place frequented by Greek gods. <laughs> so you can't imagine people. Ethiopia, the land of our fathers. There's a song that is attributed to Marcus Garvey. There are lines in it that says, Ethiopia, the land of our fathers, the land where the gods love to dwell. And all the, the Greeks are saying it. Ethiopia are first mentioned as the oldest Greek text, Homer's Iliad, as a place frequented by Greek gods. So all of the people them who know them Greek mythology and all these gods that trod up on the face of the earth. Because listen, listen people, it's not Indians and Africans alone had many gods. Europeans, Greeks, and Romans also had many gods. And they said that their gods used to go where? Can you imagine? European gods are trod in Africa. I go down to Ethiopia. Who do I go visit down there? Who the European gods have visit when them go down to Egypt and Ethiopia? Other gods. I go learn. <laughs> it sounds strange. -y. Gods, I go visit gods to learn. What are they going to learn? How to levitate, how to meditate, how to transcendentally meditate. All these things. And it says that Homer states. Twelve for Jupiter stay with the Ethiopians, at whose return Thelos prefers repetition, and Zeus 
is at the ocean river with Ethiopians feasting, he and all the heaven dwellers. I have a pause, you know, I'm going to read that, you know. Zeus at the ocean's river with Ethiopian feasting, he and all the heaven dwellers. This is Ethiopia, you know, the land of our fathers, the land where the gods love to dwell. And, and European gods are going there to feast with the heaven dwellers. That is why Ethiopia became so important to early Jamaicans. So, and so, Homer now said, Poseidon, Poseidon, Poseidon spends, also spends time in Ethiopia. But Poseidon, the earthquake lord, making his return from Ethiopia, where he had visited for a celebration in his honor. Homer also tell us that it, an Ethiopian ruled Troy and Arabia people. So my them thing, you know, when I forgot to research it and find it like how I find it. Because in this day when libraries are online, you know what is beautiful about about the technology nowadays? You can go into libraries online. Or you can read books online that were previously like gold. You know, sometimes when I was a youth growing up to find things about ancient Egypt, one had to do some serious chatting into our place and when you find a book it was almost like gold but nowadays you can just go online and see it so it says Omar also tell us that Ethiopian and Ethiopian rule Troy and Arabia Troy ancient Troy and he says Timonius was the son of Laodemon king of Troy and the nymph Strymo he was an extremely handsome youth. And when Eos first saw him, she fell in love with him and brought him to her palace by the stream of ocean in Ethiopia. They had two children, Memnon and Emotheon. Emotheon became a king of Arabia. Memnon took a force of Ethiopians to Troy and died while fighting the Greeks. So yes, the people, the history of Ethiopia is so ancient that Greeks write about it. You can imagine Greeks, Greek gods, Poseidon and Zeus, a good one Africa, you know, them celestial majesty to find out about these people, these people who the name Ethiopia means burnt face, right? So, the so called father of European history. Herodotus spoke often on the subject of Ethiopia and places it in geographical context. He says, Beyond the island, Elephantine, is a great lake, and round its shores live nomadic tribes of Ethiopians. People, homework, how many tribes are there in Ethiopia? Take your book and your pencil and write down homework. How many tribes are there in Ethiopia? After crossing the lake, one comes again to the stream of the Nile, which flows into it. After 40 days journey on land along the river, one takes another boat and in 12 days reaches a big city named Meroe, said to be the capital of the Ethiopians. And where the south declines toward the sun setting in the country called Ethiopia, the last inhabited land in that direction. There is gold, a plenty, huge elephants, wild trees of all sorts. People, this is not that easy thing, you know to absorb that ancient Ethiopia is so rich in history that Europeans are fascinated by it. And, and he goes on and he says, the men are taller and handsomer and long-lived than anywhere else. Handsomer, taller, and long-lived than anywhere else. The Ethiopians were clothed in the skin of leopards and lions and had long bows made of the stem of palm leaf, not less than four cubits in length. Of these, they had short arrows made, and he goes on to describe how they, are, how they armed themselves. They carried likewise spears, the other of which sharpened from the antelope's bone and spotted clubs when they went into battle. He said the inhabit inhabitants sometimes are so powerful that they have their own rituals and their own burial thing. 
So we want to encourage the IDM now to do their own kind of research and their own kind of scholarship into the Ethiopians. And he said, now the Ethiopians, as the students relate, were the first of all men. <laughs> the Europeans are saying that the Ethiopians are the first of all men. And that proof of the statement, they say, are manifest. For they did not come into their land as immigrants from abroad, but they were natives of it. We saw, we now speak about the Ethiopian writing that is called hieroglyphs among the Egyptians. Because the Ethiopians gave the Egyptians writing in order that we may omit nothing in our discussion. They, the Ethiopians, also say that the Egypt, Egypt was a colony of people. Egypt was a colony of Ethiopia and it was sent out by Ethiopians to go and build Egypt. The king of kings having been the leader of the colony. So, people, black people, you have a great history, you know. But you know what? They get caught up nowadays with, with um, iPad and laptop. You have become consumers and not creators of your own history and your own destiny. And look what your ancestors have created. Now, as an historian, I cannot deny the past because, you see, if you don't know your past, you don't know your future, you know. If you don't have a reference point to inspire you, how are you going to go forward? How are you going to go forward? And that is what we are here today, to diffuse, right? And so even, even other characters out of out of Egypt now, we hear about Osiris and Isis as the father and mother gods and brother and sister gods. And, and it says, Osiris came from the borders of Ethiopia. Osiris came from the borders of Ethiopia, raised on the banks of the side of the river and protected the river from inundating the land people i would have loved to see someone on the face right now because this is not new information it is just that the first time you're hearing it is and i'm going to say that again it's not new it's just that you're hearing it for the first time that is not a contradiction you know. it's truth because if something you're hearing for the first time existed it is not new it is just that you are hearing it for the first time and he wrote it to us another, another historians because they are writing now, you know, because the first time them do have nothing to write about for their own history. So they must have observe other people and their writing. There's another historian called Silicus. He described Ethiopians as black and their empire as vast from Central and East Africa to the Arabian Peninsula. And they moved the capital one time from Meroe to the east where Ethiopia mined gold. This was the same time period in which ancient Aksum leaders started to thrive. So you see people, there's no mistaking the importance of Egypt and Ethiopia because for a while they were synonymous, you know. They were synonymous. It was just until Europeans started to flood Africa now because of its resplendence. For a while, Ethiopia and, and Egypt were flooded by, by different people from all over the world. Diverse places coming to seek wealth, coming to seek prosperity, coming to seek stability. And I want to draw an analogy in the same way that many people are going to European countries now, especially Western European countries and the USA, to seek stability and fortune. It's so other people from ancient time, you know, other Europeans too, you know used to flood to Egypt and Ethiopia to seek stability because those places had good governance, they had good wealth, they had good resources. And so they made a good of a seek stability in their lives and flooded to those countries so much so that they had to write about them. Right? And, and he said, and Silicus went on to say, there are many tribes in Ethiopia. Some are dwelling on the land, lying on the banks of the Nile. And in Greek terms, 
they say that they went into the interior and they fall. They talk about the Nile. No, people, we have, to, we have to realize, you know, that as we go along, other Europeans start come now. So the Romans come. I was skipping time now, 200 AD. Later, the term Ethiopia will become synonymous with not just with Kushites, but all Africans. Unlike the earlier Greek writers who distinguished Ethiopians from other Africans, I, I hope some people know Ptolemy. P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, Ptolemy. A Roman citizen who lived in Alexandria used Ethiopia as a racial term in his, in his writings. He tried to explain the physical characteristics of people around the world, saying they are consequently black in complexion and have thick and curly hair, and they are called by the common name the Ethiopians, Ethiopian Byzantine history, and it goes along, right? So Ethiopia originally, the land surrounding Egypt, Ethiopia now, and we'll look at those countries later, maybe in the next 10, 20 minutes. The land surrounding Ethiopia now were all once part of the ancient Ethiopian civilization. Djibouti, Sudan, Somalia, Eritrea, because today Ethiopia is almost landlocked. But those countries were once a part of ancient Egyptian and and I'm going and I'm going to keep saying Egyptian and Ethiopian civilization. So the Ethiopians, although they were surrounded by all different kind of inhospitable land and swamps, they developed them. They created a unique culture, and the country became remarkable. And the world heritage made Africa at that time a very very important place for people to go to right now there are different places that that we have to consider and different time period in in ethiopian history one of the earliest town is aksum and aksum was about 30 meters high and some of the places are still exist today so we're going to step forward and come now into the dynasties of ancient ethiopia because Ethiopian history is so ancient and long that we're going to talk from now till 12 o'clock and we're done to the other seals in the program, right? So after another 500 years now, time pass, we move now to a dynasty called the Zagwe dynasty. And it emerged in a place called Lalibela in 1137. And that was a time, people. I wish I had some pictures. And I want... I want the people them to take some time out and look and look on the internet and find Lalibela. Lalibela churches, group of churches, are hewn, are cut out. Make use the word. They are cut out of rock from the ground down. And that's that's not a mistake. From the ground down words that use their own technology and carved churches and they are still there today so the work of those began in 1137 and it's around the same time that now islam was trying to spread into the country and take over many parts and i have a small picture of one of lalibela no one there them see today don't know if you can see it properly but if you look to 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 the left of the picture here you will see one of the churches of Lalibela that was hewn from the ground down out of rock and the walls were constructed between the 13th and the 16th centuries to defend its people against Islamic warriors from, who were coming from Omoro in present day um, Kenya. So by the 1600s now, there was a permanent capital founded by an emperor called Fasilades. And by the end of the 17th century, Gondar began to build magnificent palaces, beautiful gardens, public baths. And so the dynasties now began to become more important in the history of Ethiopia. And so the seal breaks for the first time. Mozi, Maisa.
With so, Styles FM on the go, you can listen to your favorite programs by calling the USA number 213-992-4360. If you're in the UK, it's 033-0010-3322. Lumber, cement, steel, plyboard, plates, cups, shower curtain, sheet. Then this now go take me all day, man. Daddy, mommy says I must go a business depot. I need to find somewhere with ample parking space, gives discounts, does delivery, and has the most courteous staff. Hmm. Why, Daddy Deffy? Yes, Builders Depot, right at Industrial Estate, Long Wall in Brands Bay. I call them at 715 3128 or 284 3337. Because I'm here, tell him, we got Builders Depot over there, so. Check them out. Builders Depot, once you need it, we have it. How we do the killing. Tune for tune is on this and every Saturday, 1215 to 1245 inside a smooth sailing. Brought to you by DIB Hardware, Shimago's Bay, Buff Bay, and Port Antonio. Tell you what, DJs and selectors, you'll be able to play live on Styles FM. Tune for tune. Get more details. Call 993-3358 or 804-7072. Do you have or are you seeking a place to rent, seeking employment or have a job vacancy? Are you selling a car or having a garage sale? Then come see us. Let Styles do the advertising for you and you'll be on your way in no time. Contact us at 876-286-9216 or 439-5160. Advertising Style. Advertise with Styles. Get up and fight for this knowledge that is coming your way, black people. So, you know, we want you to understand and to overstand to you know that this is a very serious enterprise that we have to do to take forward our knowledge of the ancient of the people who came here enslaved. Because don't feel away, you know, the people who came here enslaved were not units of labor sitting down on a coast to be entrapped and then brought and forced to work there were people who lived in their own civilization that had their own cities their own religion their own language their own ways of being their own mythology their own superstitions 
their own internal affairs, their own politics, their own churches, their own states. And so when they were brought here, they were not empty vessels. They were emptied purposely by European hegemonic rule that preached narrative of just superiority. So many of those persons who came here had a clear vision and a clear contact with themselves. Now, let's, let's make sure that we are going to link now and make a connection to an emperor named Menelik II. Menelik II now was the emperor who brought, in many ways, Ethiopia into a state of modernity. The notion of modernity has to deal with the idea that civilization has grown from one stage to the next and has embraced certain ideas that unifies that unifies the people into a cohesive state with a common system of government with a common education system with with common systems that benefit the people so let's 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 look at the old testament he said the old testament makes no fewer than 30 references to ethiopia kush to the hebrews moses was an ethiopian woman that was in numbers according to the tradition the ethiopian nation was founded by ethiopic e-t-i-o-p-i-k ethiopic great grandson of noah hmm. according to tradition great grandson of Noah and Aksum was founded by Aksum and he was Ethiopic's son Aksumai Queen Makeda Queen Makeda of Sebea or some people say Sheba would have been a member of this dynasty she ruled a vast era that included Yemen and in her reign Ethiopians traded with peoples as far as Palestine and India. Makeda ventured to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon, by whom she bore a son. And you know what his name was? Menelik. Menelik from Ibn al-Malik, son of the king. Thus was established the silent Solomonic dynasty, from which the kings of Ethiopia rose. And I'm going to share a little fable with you. A little fable says that when when um when Makeda to visit Solomon, when Makeda went to visit Solomon, he was so enamored by her beauty that he decided that he wanted to have a son. Now, these this 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 story is recorded in a book called The Kebernegast or The Glory of Kings. And so Solomon, in a way, beguiled Makeda. He prepared a feast for Makeda, Makeda, and he said, "And he said, um, if I if I if I catch you drinking out of my golden goblet in the night, you have to bear me a son." No, I don't know how he knew that you're going to bear him a son, but so says the fable. You have to bear me a son, and so the feast was elaborate, very spicy, though you know. And Makeda had her fill. And at a certain point in the night, she became thirsty. And no matter what she did, she couldn't find any, any, any water to drink. No wine, no other sweet, you know, meats and all those wonderful luxuries. She couldn't find any water to drink. And so she was searching around. And there on a table in Solomon's tent, one of Solomon's tent was a goblet of water. And so Makeda took it up and had her fail. Only when she rolled it down, who should say? Solomon. So the fable goes. So the fable goes. And so Makeda had to bear Solomon a son, and his name was Menelik. And from that we call him Menelik the First. And that Solomonic dynasty lasted until 1974 it is it is believed that that ancient menelik visited solomon in jerusalem for three years as a young adult learning mosaic law and returned to ethiopia with the ark of the covenant people <laughs> people this 
is not any myth making or any conjuring this is something that we research and we have been reading from where we're a child and now we're sharing with you after embracing it for over 40 years we have been embracing these stories for over 40 years and now it's available on sites on the world wide web that you can go and get the same information so it says that this this menelik son of solomon king solomon and this queen of aksum sheba had a child and his name was menelik and he after going to jerusalem carried the ark of the covenant back to ethiopia what a serious turn of event and so there there are it is also said that jewish falasha who were descendant of the jews of solomon and some scholars identify queen makeda with queen bikilis of yemen ethiopia has existed in some form as an identifiable state, state since the 10th century bc much more recently the ancient greeks and romans knew of the ethiopians and traded with them so you see people ethiopia is so ancient that the greeks were bes and, and there's a little word sometimes i use you know the greeks were besotted they were enamored with the ethiopians that they constantly wrote they constantly visited them and there's a tale that alexander the greek who they call alexander the great when he was on his escapades and he was sacking cities when he came up on the library in alexandria he started burn books because he himself really couldn't read much you know he had a library and it had about 12 books 12 books compared to thousands of books in the library at alexandria and he started to burn them can you imagine you you are you're a, you're a so-called conqueror and you're you're thrust your your is to burn books in the library this is a greek alexander the greek who died ingloriously but anyway so we want to move now to the emperor called menelik but before we do that where is ethiopia today where is ethiopia today ethiopia is the land the, the, the home of lions and and leopards and giraffes and elephants and rhinoceros and warthogs and various ibexes and giraffes and gazelles and antelope and buffaloes monkeys baboon hyena jackal wolf it is said sometimes that there's even a problem with um with monkeys in the in in ethiopia they will come and even take your food out of your plate sometime when you're trying to you know just have a time so where's ethiopia today today ethiopia itself as it today stands is surrounded by by somalia kenya uganda all right let's be more specific to the east you have somalia and Djibouti and yemen and to like the northeast northeast you have yemen and saudi arabia and then north kind of northwest you have sudan and southwest you have uganda so it's almost kind of landlocked these days you know and it's not as big as it was before so we're going to segue you know into this man called menelik the second because menelik the second gained fame in modern history by being one of the modern rulers that we want but why is the word modern to mean somebody who existed in the 20th century the 19th and the 20th century because menelik defeated a european country at the height of european rulership and invasion of of africa there was a conference in europe in the 1800s and i want to find out when everything i just tell you the dates exactly there's a conference in europe in the 1800s and at this conference in a place start with b in western europe they sat down 
and they just drew lines. They drew lines in Africa and carved up Africa. Carved up Africa. And say, you take that, you take that, you take that. So the Europeans had their own design about Africa. You take peace. But let's go to Menelik because Menelik will inflict now on one of these European nations that was on its expansionist phase a defeat that caused the same Italians to come back again. They were defeated in the 1890s and I soon tell you when. And they came back in the 1930s and were defeated again. So it's an inglorious thing, you know. <laughs> Menelik the second was born in August 1884. His father, Haile Menkot, was king of Shewa from 1847 to 1856. Menelik II. Menelik was said to be the next ruler of Shewa, but was taken away. And at this time, there was a lot of intrigue, intrigue in Ethiopia about rulership, and rulership was changing. And 10 years later, in 1865, 1865, ring a bell, Jamaicans, Menelik escaped Twedoros. And with the help of his family and friends, he became ruler of Shewa. Now, remember also, you know, that there was a time in history where there were different kings in almost everywhere in the world. Europe had their feudalism, and different countries had different kings. And it happened in Africa too. So this time now, there's a time when they had their own feudal rules in, in Africa too. So in, it happened in Ethiopia. So he became the ruler of Shewa. He remained ruler for 24 years before he became emperor upon the death of Johannes. But it wasn't very easy for Menelik. He had to fight his own way and eventually became emperor of Europe. Now for nearly two decades, Menelik before he became emperor was faithful to Johannes. But Menelik as his at his own design his ambition was to become emperor and he was consumed by it and so in 1875 Menelik started an alliance with a group of people named the Khedive in Egypt to form an ally with them to overthrow and to take power in Egypt now in um, Ethiopia I don't want anyone to even imagine that all of this would is seamless it is not that Menelik was just given the crown and he became king. Men are men. And there are certain times when there is intrigue and a lot of fighting that results in one person being deposed. And it happened. It happened in that way. Menelik hoped he would obtain access to the sea coast and get a su supply of firearms. You know what Menelik did? Menelik was one of the first Ethiopian leaders who formed alliances and started to trade with Europeans and start set up different contacts with Europeans because he realized that the Europeans were there. The British were in, in, in all over Africa. The French were, were in North Africa. The Portuguese were there. The Belgians were there. They were all over the place. Now, how could this nation that remained unconquered by an outside force maintain its independence? Now, Menelik was the king at that time who was caught up in this kind of conundrum. For much of the 1880s, 1880s Menelik's expansion campaigned towards the south and his increased the size of his own empire. Eventually, when the Egyptians, Menelik was able to occupy Loa and, and Genoa and Gibe, and he took control of Kolo and Conte. And in 1889, he began the occupation of Kombala. And in 1894, he took Kafe. Three years later, one of the last great conquests as the king of Shea was Harar. Harar was the province from which his majesty rose to become emperor of Ethiopia. And so, when the Egyptians now leave Harar, many decide that, listen, it is time for us to take full control and so on the 6th of january 1887 menelik's troops took over and menelik appointed a cousin of makonen that name sound familiar a cousin of makonen as emperor of harar 
and he became eventually he became emperor of ethiopia we're not going to go through all of that history what we want to go to know is what caused the italians and menelik to go to war because there was a time when menelik had serious trade relations and diplomatic relations with italy and england and france because he was fascinated by technology at the time we can't judge through our contemporary eyes the kind of technology that he would be fascinated with but just let's say we don't think about our contemporaries thing but think about just contextually the kind of technology that he would be fascinated with and so he quoted the, the, the Europeans, he quoted the Italians. So he said the Italians and Menelik signed the infamous treaty of Wikale. There were two versions made, the Amaric version, which gave Menelik the choice of using Italy's good offices for contacts with other countries. The Italian version obligated Menelik to make all such contracts to Italy, thus making Ethiopia an Italian protectorate. <laughs> that never go down with well with Menelik. When Menelik discovered the misunderstanding, he immediately wrote to the Queen, to Queen Victoria, who was then and wrote to the ruler of Germany and the president of France, insisting that Ethiopia is independent. So you see, the Ethiopians now tried to trick Menelik into giving up Ethiopia and the tradition that Ethiopia has is one of continuous independence although they had their own internal feud nobody conquered ethiopia so this treaty now signed by and it's consistent with a lot of europeans isn't it that they would sign treaties that would belittle and conquer people in their own making when many discovered the misunderstanding he wrote to to um victoria he wrote to the ruler of germany President of France insisting that Ethiopia is an independent nation. In 1893, Menelik denounced the treaty. And by 1895, Ethiopia and Italy were at war. They were at war. So you see, Menelik now, being a warrior who rose through the ranks and had to fight to stay in power, was no stranger to war. He was a brilliant military strategist. And people out there, you have to go, you know, and ensure that you look on pictures of Menelik with his beautiful wife called Taito. He married Taito. And, and marriage was a political alliance because you have to realize that in those days when you had a country split up in different so-called let's use the word kingdoms sometimes marriage were mil were political alliances and so in on march 1896 many troops crushed the italian army at adwa ethiopia later italy did recognize ethiopia as an independent nation it have no choice <laughs> They defeated you in battle. So as we said before, you know, let me read something again for you. There were two versions of this treaty. The treaty was the Treaty of Wikale. And all of this is, you can just go and research it yourself. And the Treaty of Wikale had two versions. One version that said that, you know, everything is okay. You can use Italy's good office for contact with other countries. But then there was an Italian version now which made it seem that Menelik was obliged to do everything through Italy without maintaining his independence. Now, this offended Menelik. This offended Menelik and the, the, the war. After the, bat, the Battle of Adwa, Menelik refocused his attention to expanding Ethiopia's territory further south and of the west. One of the first major Acquirement was that of Kefa, and he went on to build Ethiopia into a new, let's call it a modern nation. During the reign of Menelik, electricity, telephone, indoor plumbing, 
advancements in health, advancements in education. Ethiopia became a member of the International Postal, Postal Union and he constructed a railway from Addis Ababa to the Djibouti and he connected this country to the outside world. It increased commerce. In 1906, this is a man who was coming from 1860 yard. In 1906, Menelik had a stroke and he became very ill. And by 19... 11 he he was so ill that he has to pass his reign now to other people Taitu was to take over because at the time the europeans were impressed by her level of intelligence and her willingness to work but because of all of the in the competition between these different houses Taitu had to flee she had to leave and fled out of the country. And, and history says that after Menelik, the next first true ruler that would bring Ethiopia into even more modernity was who? His Imperial Majesty Emperor Ali Selassie. I. It says, that, and, I, and, I, and I read it, it says that Menelik died in December of 1913 he was born in August 1844 and he died in December of 1913 and he says the country fell into a period of uncertainty the next true ruler was his Selassie and he was not crowned until 1930 so for let's say for 17 years there was a period of uncertainty. So many the second, all the history students who don't learn this in school because history just finished the six, you know, like like keep history and see sec history. But I'm sure the students either would never have heard of Menelik, or even if they heard of Menelik, they would probably have heard of Menelik if they did some European history and not African history. And if they heard of Menelik, it probably would be something very, just very basic and not the kind of information that I would want you to have. So Menelik, the first son of Solomon and Queen Sheba. Menelik, the second, a descendant of the Solomonic line. The Solomonic line lasted until 1974 when his imperial majesty was deposed. It lasted until that time. And so Menelik the second now was one of the many African leaders. Because sometimes people say he's the only African who defeat who defeat Europeans. No man, Shaka Zulu defeated the British long before that. <laughs> and other another queens of, of Africa defeated Europeans too as well. And the whom he fought and defeated European armies too as well. And so Menelik the second is one of the many. African leaders who defeated Europeans and their style. And he defeated Italy at a time when the Europeans were rampant. Especially the British, them little British man. Especially the British and the French and, and the Portuguese and the Belgians. One Belgian king named Leopold said the Congo was his personal property. And the British were rampant all over Africa. So much so that Europeans have left their language on African peoples. With the exception probably of Ethiopia. Most, a lot of African countries have a foreign language as their official language. The official language of Nigeria is English. The Cameroonians speak French. Senegal speak French. Many African countries, their national language is a foreign language. That was how rampant the Europeans were over, over, over Africa. But not in Ethiopia. Ethiopia's official language is Amharic. Amharic is a very ancient language. And you need to look at how it is written. Because it gave India its culture. Ethiopia gave India the river Ganges. The most sacred river. Named in honor of an Ethiopian general. Because the Ethiopian empire stretched even into India. So, here we're going to. We're going to play two more music.
as you feast on these things, these edutainment value for make your headspace tingle with delight. Come forward, you know, you know what? Uh, we think we like how the vibes come in so far. Some people come in and texting in and say, Yeah, them like you with them them like here with them here and you know, we want the people them for really make sure that you you overstand the thrust of this today. Because as I said before, you know, nothing that is taught remain learnt. Nothing that is taught remain learned because sometimes people teach something to a, a group of people a generation of people and sometimes you don't teach it again and it gets lost because the youths who are coming up don't know what you know you you can't take it for granted because you know it your 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 offsprings or your children or your friends will know it unless you share it you have to share it and so this is a this is a reawakening. This is a reawakening. So that people can refocus themselves on Ethiopia as a source of empowerment. Because this seal now, when you look at Ethiopia, as how Ethiopia influenced Pan Africanism. How did Ethiopia influence Pan Africanism? How did Ethiopia give rise to this? this Pan-African movement, these people in the so-called diaspora and, and their quest to empower themselves. 
how did that happen where did the black man in the diaspora use or find the inspiration to use this listen hear this now the same bible that was presented to him as the king james version is the same bible that he dug into and deconstructed and took ideas out of it that became of it it is almost contradictory that this bible that that was given became a source of serious intellectual and and psychological warfare i remember when i started to first read the bible to reconfigure my own thinking people around me were offended because they, it seemed as though i'm i'm not using the bible correctly but you know what out of the bible is a verse you know that says prince and king shall come out of egypt ethiopia just shall stretch forth her hands unto god it was verses like that that people like robert love in jamaica and even marcus gavi himself started to investigate what do they mean by by kings ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto god princes and king shall come out of egypt princes and king shall come out of egypt ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto god prince and king shall come Ethi what do they mean by ethiopia shall stretch forth her hands unto god what what does herodotus mean when he said that um um zeus and poseidon went to to egypt to to eat with the gods and so the african man in jamaica people of african descent and let me let me tell you you see the people of african descent who kind pan-africanism these were christian men you know these were men who were baptist ministers but found it that how can i be a minister in a church that disregards my person that enslaves my people where is my reference point they turned to ethiopia they turned to ethiopia as a place where they saw the Solomonic dynasty that we just mentioned people you have to go over and look you know and you have to rehear some of the things when we say they mention the Solomonic dynasty that bible mentioned king solomon and the people in the bible land solomon was the wisest man and yet solomon was the father of Menelik the first and Menelik the second came out of the same Solomonic line that defeated um the italians and in 1935 when the italians caused his majesty to go into exile into england and his majesty returned to ethiopia he inflicted another defeat on italians now it was at that time between 1896 and 1935 and even before in the 1850s that trinidadians and jamaican intellectuals started to look to africa as a way to re-identify and to reconfigure and to reposition themselves in the center of their own thinking and as such they started to look to to africa as a metaphor of freedom that's serious thing you know they started to look to africa as a metaphor of freedom and they coined the word ethiopianism and out of that came the notion of pan-africanism where africans outside of africa started to look at africa not to look at specific tribes now you know because by that time people now never had any kind of way of connecting with their tribes it was very hard for you to connect with your tribe if you were taken out for so many hundred years and lost so what did they do they created a metaphorical pan-africanism to identify themselves specifically too with ethiopia as freedom ethiopia the land of our fathers the land where the gods look to dwell ethiopia mentioned by herodotus 
as a place where the gods of Europe went to have dinner in heaven with the, with the gods of heaven. <laughs> and so the black man in Jamaica now, the first battle when in 1896 when Italy was defeated, the second battle again, the same Italy. And as I said before, you know, young Mussolini was a little, was a little um, conscript in the army in 1896, you know. And it's him come back 1935 to come try and finish the work of his of his people the work of his people to try and colonize um ethiopia because the italians did have part of ethiopia where they call eritrea but they wanted the whole place so mostly in the comfort and was defeated no the rastafarians in jamaica there's a lot of history the rastafarians in jamaica identified with that battle and created different narratives out of it was the Nyabingi rhythm Nyabingi was a resistance movement in east africa specifically uganda that rose up against british colonialism and the Nyabingi was a metaphor i don't want to use the word i'm going to use the word system of of kings and of queens naya bingi herself was a queen a warrior queen but naya bingi was transformed into a rhythm of resistance and the war drums of naya bingi was said to be beaten to help his majesty defeat the armies of italy and so pan-africanism was forged now from the 1850s right down to 1919 when the first congress was held in the united states by 1919 people were calling for a congress of black people world over to speak about their issues to speak about their issues and historically this was the first time that people of african descent in the diaspora and we use the word diaspora again and again to mean those areas in which people were dispersed now it was the first time you know, that black people were saying, you know what, let's come together and talk about our business. And they use the metaphor of Ethiopianism now as a vehicle that brought them together. All of these people identified with Ethiopia as a place that they could look up to because, you know what, it was the only African country that never colonized and got through no whole heap of slavery by Europeans. Although, although we check the history, the British man did in Ethiopia. I was trying to manipulate the government and the kings to, to, to see which one of them they could get on their side. And that's why Menelik had to come in and try to, to forge links with all of these European powers because they were there. It's not, it's not as though Ethiopia remained free and, and immune because the Europeans were there. And so this, this independent country was an inspiration to those Africans outside of Africa who were looking for a reason to be proud of their heritage. And Ethiopia was that place. It remained unconquered. Remember, you know, in the 1930s, there was no so quote unquote called independent African country and African continent. The South, the Dutch, and the English were there fighting the Boer Wars and all the other things. In Central Africa, the British were there, and and French were there in North Africa. The French were there, and they were there. Even the Spanish were there <laughs> in different places. So where could a black man outside of Africa look as inspiration? And he looked to Ethiopia, and he found inspiration in Ethiopia. And it influences Pan-African thing, but not thing. How dare I say thing? It influences Pan-African philosophy. And so much so that Marcus Gavino was the first man who galvanized the Pan-African, and I'm going to use the word aesthetic ethic, when he said, look to Africa for the crowning of a black king. He shall be the redeemer. Look to Africa for the crowning of a black king. He shall be the redeemer. The author said that it is these words that galvanize 
the Jamaican and even not even in Jamaica, you know, in the United States, in Trinidad, in in South America, in Central America, and galvanized black people to follow in Garvey. It also goes on to say that Garveyites later they spark Garveyites later into forming what is now called Rastafari. It's contested, you know. Because some people would say how well wasn't that how well was called one of the first conceptualizers of the Rastafari movement probably was not a Garveyite. But when you look at the history, a lot of Garveyites became members of the Rastafari philosophy and movement. And so Garvey, as a Jamaican Pan-Africanist, heavily influenced the thinking of the Rastafari movement. And this notion of Ethiopia stretching forth her hands unto God influenced Rastafari philosophy and Rastafari thought. And so in 1930, when, when Tafari Makonen, Ras Tafari Makonen, was crowned as Haile Selassie, King of King, Lord of Lords, Conqueror of Triumph, Juba, it kind of gave the persons who were reading the Bible and this Marcus Garvey pronunciation the impetus and we're not going to go into all of the biblical um, references that influence Rastafari to 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 do that but we want to hear some tune for make us for me for wet your appetite again so me 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 engineer go and play anything of his child 400 years by counter C that would be a good one play something of colonial reign has brought the people misery has left them such pain the talk is now of independence you see seems it wasn't meant for you or for me As we came, slave trade was the game. And ever since we don't even know our name. Our heritage we must remember. They did to mother and father. All right, 400 years of colonial reign. You can imagine. So, after 400 years of slavery, how are people going to free themselves? And and people would say, why why are you talking about people using Ethiopia as as a reference point? But remember, you know, even when people were were given freedom. They still, 1838, when slavery was abolished, is a hundred and odd years after that, before people were given the right to vote. It's a hundred and seven years after that. Now, if people were free, why were they denied the right to participate in their own governance? So we were freed three times, 1807, the slave trade abolish that I'm still not suitable for freedom yet so then wait again and 1838 them give you another freedom you're still not really suitable yet and by the 1850s the same men who they thought that were not capable of ruling themselves start to develop ideas and start to look to something else 1896 the battle of adwa 1865 the moran Bay rebellion before that, 
the French, the, the Haitian Revolution, that was kept silent by, by Europe because they never wanted to influence the rest of the place. And so there were so many different poignant moments in the development of history of the people in the diaspora. And then the Maroons in Jamaica. And we have to have a discourse about calling people Maroons, you know. Even the Maroons themselves who call them people Maroons. A different discourse. Had to look and find some way of liberating themselves. And so by the time you reach 1890s and the 1900s, and, and, and well, people started to redefine themselves. And so Marcus Garvey, in using the words and the ideas of people who go, went before him, people like Robert Love to be specific, who wrote text and other Pan-Africanists who paved the way, but he was the bold one who went out and formed an organization. And, and the, students, the students of history will know the name of the organization, the UNIA, but I don't know if if it is taught in such a way for you to appreciate really the power that this man have before computer, BC, before computer. What Marcus Garvey did was, was phenomenal even until this day. Which, which organization that is organized for black people is as powerful and as potent and as big and as organized as the UNIA was in the 19, in the 1920s to the 19, to the mid 1930s. Because by the time His Majesty had defeated um, the British, the UNIA was probably going through its last phases as a powerful organization. So much so that Marcus Garvey was disappointed when His Majesty left um, Ethiopia he even called him the cowardly lion. Because Marcus Garvey felt that he should have stayed and fought. But there are different ways to win a battle. Eh? And so His Majesty now, with the aid of the British, and we don't want to deny all of that history, because some people would say that he just went to England. I mean, how could he just go to England like that and then come back to Ethiopia and win a war? He got help, and he garnered his forces and he defeated the British, the, um, the Italians. So this meant something to, again to people in, in the diaspora. So the Pan-African movement was stronger now, now that His Majesty inflicted a defeat on a European nation. This man was an ally of the Germans. It wasn't an easy thing because the Germans themselves were also in, in North and East Africa looking colonies. There was even a, a a, a, um, a time when they castrated some men in Harar. They castrated them. The Germans castrated the men because in their heads they never want them to reproduce. So Ethiopia itself went through a lot as well, although it was not colonized. It was still strangled and, and invaded time and time again. So much so that a piece of it was cut off and Eritrea was created by the Italians and the Germans. And the whole the whole vast empire was reduced. You need people you need to go look at a map. It was reduced to what it is today. It was bigger than that before. So it was reduced now. And Africa itself was sliced up. And so Ethiopianism became a serious focal point. And then Rastafari now became the vehicle through which Pan-Africanism and Ethiopianism kind of coalesced and flourished anew. Because after the UNI went through its phases and kind of, you know, became less potent. It never died. It just became less potent. The next most potent movement was Rastafari, although it never had the same perspective as, as Garvey's movement. Garvey's movement was, was, was more based, more broad based, at economic arm, at political arm. It's a shipping company. There were newspapers. There were serious organizations. They had huge conferences all over the world. They built liberty halls. Garvey would build a liberty hall everywhere he went. 
so much so that there's a liberty all still functioning he had over 200 branches lit scattered all over the world so it was much more powerful than than the more religious let's use the word religious liberty religio liberty kind of organization that rastafari is and continues to be because that's that's more mystical so ethiopia influenced pan-africanism it influenced rastafari to the extent that many rastafarians say we are ethiopians we are ethiopians that's 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 the foundation in many ways of an ethiopia remains bob marley even say zion is ethiopia ethiopia is zion zion the pan earth zion is ethiopia that's all fundamentally ingrained into the pan-africanist stroke rastafari aesthetic ethiopia is is a central part and it's not only for jamaica to because later we're going to look at the ethiopian world federation in the last seal we see how important how important the ethiopia became as and i use the word metaphor of freedom and centralized effort of the rastafari and the pan-africanist movement and and you know what as i said before you know, we're going to spend our next program one time looking at pan-africanism because that is very important to look at because pan-africanism need to be shared with the africans on the continent and i would like to tell some africans out there who are listening to pan-africanism need to be shared with the africans on the continent to make them realize that whenever they falter and whenever they they suicide bomb their own citizens that africans in the diaspora feel a sense of huge embarrassment it, me i feel it i i said to myself why are we doing that why are we taking on the mantle of 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 bombing our own people in the name of religious philosophy why you have to put on something on you and bomb your people how did that come into africa why why you kidnap 200 girls why you do that how can you kill your people to rule them but then mankind has been doing that then there are people will tell you mankind has been doing that for millennia but it means that mankind is living in a very kind of inferior very kind of nihilistic egotistic way because what would it benefit a man to kill his own people in order to rule them i don't remember the name of the african lady who won a nobel um peace prize and asked that of a so-called warlord she said when you kill your people who are you going to rule when you destroy your own people who are you going to rule and so from as a pan-africanist myself who look to africa as as homeland as inspiration and and adopted an african name to prove my africanness it pains my heart man to see my african leaders turning on their own people and i don't want to be told that it is human nature if it is human nature it is not a good human nature whether you're africans or saudi arabians or iranians or iraqis whether you're muslim or christian or hindu to be killing your own people in order to rule them no religion will rule the next religion it will never happen there there, there won't be any mega narrative that will dictate that this religion will be the world religion it's, that's not going to happen it's a futile thing because the more you oppress people the more they distance themselves from the oppressor i saw it go and we know that too for the best quality in sound 
reinforcement and backlining, native audio. We have professional engineers with over 20 years of experience. So call us and we'll take care of your parties, wedding receptions, barbecues, conferences, and small stage shows. Crystal clear sound, native audio. Our prices are the best. Call us at 871-5212. That's 871-5212. Native audio. We make your events audible. 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 St. Mary, Styles FM, the People's Nation, is now on your radio, 96.1 and 96.7 on your FM band. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Styles FM, your northeastern radio station based in Portland, Jamaica. Tune in now. Architects, draftsmen, and surveyors, get your drawings printed in high-quality professional standards. We can satisfy your printing needs. Whether it is for presentation to your clients or for submitting building and subdivision application, make it VJ Printing Services. Whether drawing by hand or with computer-aided softwares, we will plot your negatives and print the copies as you need. We do high-quality white paper printing that is water-resistant and never fades, unlike traditional blueprint. For more information, call VJ Printing at 893 2266 Hey, this is me, Brother Gary. I tell you, if you want to advertise anything you have, if you sell anything, truck, car, bus, anything you're keeping, make sure you advertise the past times of them. Call this number 439 4395160. And I guarantee you, everybody, I go into your business.
Yeah, people, welcome forward. People in uh, all over Portland. People in uh, England. People in uh, Jamaica. People in uh, St. Thomas and Spanish Town. and Anybody in uh, London uh, listen? Where the people them there? It's a nice thing. And so today the focus was Ethiopia. The land of our fathers. The land where the gods love to dwell. The land where Poseidon and Zeus go have dinner with the gods. The land that inspired the Pan-African movement. The land that inspired Rastafari. The land that has given us the Ethiopian World Federation. There's an organization called the Ethiopian World Federation. I had the privilege to, to go to a function one day. And was invited by a schoolmate. We were on the track team together in high school. Rasta man. I were a Rasta from high school days. And he come to me and said, come to this organization. I want you to be a part. And I heard of the Ethiopian World Federation. But I wasn't really very knowledgeable about it. And I never had the interest to find out about it. But when the Virgin approached me, I said, you know what? Let me take this time to find out now about it. Because that's how life is. Sometimes there are times when you just find that the moment has arrived to do a particular task. So I, I decided to go to the meeting. Lo and behold, I said to myself, well, this is something that I have to do. If it's from Ethiopia, if it's from His Majesty, if it's, if it's for black people's benefit, I need to find out. The, the Ethiopian World Federation in Jamaica has its own constitution. This, the Virgin referred to it as a green book. This is the constitution of the Ethiopian World Federation. The Ethiopian World Federation was incorporated as in, in August 25th, 1937 in the state of New York and it registered as a 501c4 civic league social welfare tax exempt membership organization so in 1937 his majesty commissioned this organization but let me tell you some more the ewf in jamaica is still working there's one chapter left i'm going to tell you more about it there's one chapter left called local 43 so the ewf is registered in Ethiopia. It's registered in the United Nations Economic and Social Council as a non-governmental organization, still as we speak today. And it's devoted to uphold global peace and justice and engage in providing charitable services and projects for the upliftment of its members and communities in Africa and the diaspora. A powerful organization that and because of how governments and united nations structure themselves these organizations have access to funding once they're once they're properly set up and and properly um organized according to the constitution they are so the organization becomes eligible for funding you won't get the money in your hand but if you have projects the projects will be funded because of the nature of your organization the organization was founded by his imperial majesty emperor Ali Selassie of ethiopia at the request of leaders of the harlem community in new york who visited the emperor while he was in exile in bath so you see when one door is open, closed many more open so while his majesty was in exile he was visited by people by africans in the diaspora in harlem and you know that at that time in harlem harlem was going through what they call the harlem renaissance where there are black people in harlem and along with a movement uh, called negritude movement were rethinking how they view themselves through the lens of art but then again once you start think everything gets 
caught up into your whole process. And so, out of their wish to do something for Ethiopia, they visited His Majesty and he launched um, the organization. They sought an audience with His Majesty to discuss financial matters. In response to the emperor directed his emissary and personal physician, Dr. Malaku E. Bryan, to incorporate the organization with one of his staff to, fund, to streamline fundraising efforts by way of the sons and daughters of Africans in the diaspora. So here are people now who, who our people were enslaved and I want to get the people them out in, our, out in the world this terminology enslaved stop say slaves stop say slaves enslaved people remember before you know I said that Africans were not sitting on the banks of rivers or at the edge of burnt out villages or in trees or, on, or in dungeons on a seashore waiting to be oiled and cleansed and packaged like sardines and then brought here and just walk like zombies and plant cane and reap it and process it and sell it send it back to Europe to be sold people were enslaved and they were forced to work and they fought and died remember you know within less than a hundred years of coming to this strange place the maroons had the british signing a treaty and although the british in many ways had forced both of them had themselves their own agenda the british had their own agenda while they signed the treaty and the maroons had their agenda while they signed it they were different agenda the british public could no longer spend resources fighting and losing and winning and fighting because they won some battles before and the maroons won some too and it was it was a tit for tat it was like the maroons won everything and then the british were forced to sign a treaty we have to read history and read it correctly and so the ethiopian world federation now is an organization that was designed to help put social programs in place for Africans in the diaspora. Because as I said before, you know, the United Nations to this day has a whole heap of funding that they could make available to charitable organizations. So the people in the diaspora rallied. They were outraged by the war. Many traveled to Ethiopia to join the army. One of them was Colonel Robinson from Chicago, who was an EWF member. But his Imperial Majesty also gave thought who also gave through the, world, the Ethiopian World Federation a constitution by laws. This is it. This is the constitution that he gave to the Ethiopian World Federation. And the preamble reads as this. We the black peoples of the world, in order to effect unity, solidarity, liberty, freedom, and self-determination, to secure justice and maintain the integrity of Ethiopia, which is our divine heritage, do hereby establish and ordain this constitution for the Ethiopian World Federation Incorporated. Every member of the EWF gets this. Once you become a member, you get this constitution. And it is your duty to read it because in it is a picture of the personal vision of His Majesty in it, you can't see it yet. An article says, the name of the organization shall be the Ethiopian World Federation. One of its aims is to promote love and goodwill among Ethiopians at home and abroad, and thereby to maintain the integrity and sovereignty of Ethiopia, to disseminate the ancient Ethiopian culture among its members, to correct abuses, relieve oppression and, and cure and carve for ourselves and our posterity a destiny comparable with the idea of perfect manhood and God's purpose in creating us to promote and pursue happiness to usher in teaching and practice of the fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man to promote and stimulate interest among the members in rural affairs and to cultivate a spirit of international goodwill 
to promote friendly interest among its members, to develop a fraternal spirit, to render voluntary aid and protection to its members, to give concrete, material and voluntary aid without fee or charge, to encourage its members to develop interest and pride in democratic institutions. These are just some of the articles in the constitution. The headquarters of the Ethiopian World Federation shall be in the city of New York State of the, of the United States. The colors, the official colors of the Ethiopian World Federation shall be the same as the national colors of Ethiopia. And everybody, men and women, are invited to be membership. And it has a fee that you pay. The Ethiopian World Federation is still existing. It needs to be strengthened. Because when His Majesty come to Jamaica, you know, when His Majesty give this organization to the world, he gave it to all black people. It is sometimes very sad that these this Pan-African aesthetic and this Pan-African thrust is probably only maintained by Rastafari because there are many people who are not Rastafari who needs to be a part of this because you know what? We have the same kind of beginning. So the Imperial Majesty gave the Ethiopian World Federation a constitution and it is for people worldwide. In keeping with the trust, he had assigned the EWF Incorporated as a protectorate for black people of the world. In 1948, go further now, you know, the emperor granted lands in Sheshamani in Ethiopia in the name of the Ethiopian World Federation for people of African heritage in the diaspora desiring to return to the motherland with a promise to provide more lands in the future as needed thereby creating a perpetual land grant the serious enough black people <laughs> black people the serious enough this perpetual land grant is explained to me by the present president of the local 43 brothers brother Brissett. Brother Brissett says that the idea is that once you take an acreage, a number of hectares of land, and once you develop it, you are insured of more land. You don't have to buy it, you know. People, you don't have to buy it once you are developed. So there's a perpetual land grant that the Ethiopians are still honoring. They are still honoring it. We, are, we, we probably have to have an investigation into the state of the land grant as it is now in Ethiopia. But you know what, Mr. Operator, you are a song for the people them now. People them will get raggy with all of this information. Give them a song.
is far eye and we want the people them understand and overstand because we don't want to understand then that this, this land grant has been taken up by many peoples but there is there are present problems you know where people are not really living up to the original idea of the grant which is to go there and be productive not to see it as a place to just go and just be in africa you know because we love ethiopia it's much much more than that as it says the land grant is there and people many attempts have been made previously by by the emperor to encourage africans in this, the diaspora to take up employment opportunities and to help in the development of ethiopia there weren't many takers despite tempting benefits like free housing free cars and paid extended vacation including airfare in 1970 the first the, the emperor personally appointed ross solomon wolde a director of the ewf and a jamaican as well along with chief resident country representative bj moody represent the iwa the ewf head office in Ethiopia on the land grant under the oversight of the executive council of the headquarters in new york in response to the 1961 back to get back to africa fact-finding mission underwritten by the government of jamaica you know what is significant about that fact-finding mission is that although many jamaicans went on that mission including rest little and um smith and uh, um I don't remember all the names of the people oh wow but they went on this mission but only ethiopia made a commitment give a land grant all the other countries recognized yes yes we have um, brothers and sisters in the diaspora yes yes they are africans some some african countries say they are not africans anymore and contentions about his majesty even before the fact-finding mission almost 20 years before had already gone and given this land grant let me tell you again but when you must remember you know in 1948 in 1948 the emperor granted lands in cheshire more than 60 years ago ethiopia in the name of the ethiopian world, world federation for people of african heritage in the diaspora desiring to return to the motherland with a promise to provide more lands in the future if needed so the ethiopian world federation still exists it has its offices in the united states and it has its problem it has its, its charter but the local 43 also exists and probably is probably the only functioning local chapter let me backtrack all the there are many charters locals over the world the, the chapters of the the ethiopian world federation are called are called locals local branches or charters of the federation are located worldwide the caribbean the usa europe africa and south america the constitution has guidelines for the function of locals and the executive council and provides for committees and units addressing matters including membership ways and means financing education information juvenile and musical units women women's issues pub publicity health benefits all of that constitution outline but i want to speak to the local 43 that exists at in jamaica there is at I spoke to Brother Brissett, who is the president, and Brother Brissett lived in Ethiopia for six years, from 1969. He said that he became interested when he met Brother Wolde, the same Brother Wolde that um, he was working in, in a gully, he said, and he met Brother Wolde of the Ethiopian World Federation. And he became interested in a young man and he never really had a, a, a lever, a bearing, and the Ethiopian World Federation became his bearing, and he became a member. And by, he became a member in 1967, and by 1969, he was in Ethiopia. He lived in Ethiopia for six years, 
and he spent 11 months and eventually he met the emperor and at that time he said mr the gentleman named james piper was the administrator he was from montserrat himself and his wife and he was at the palace and he was working for his majesty as well and then he said that manly interestingly i never know this manly and shira went to sheshamani they went to sheshamani but manly died in 69 they went to sheshamani because the land grant probably appealed to them but they did nothing i mean them come back to jamaica and they did nothing there were ambassadors that were set up and he said one of the first ambassador was a man called aston foreman and he was one of the persons who were supposed to ensure that something happened nothing happened nothing happened and i say it again nothing happened so like a stock record but how can the prime minister and and one of his you know go there and nothing happened but interestingly when brother brisset went to ethiopia he found uriah brown he found lenford bar he found desmond christie he found noel noel dyer all jamaicans living in ethiopia trying to get the sheshamani land grant active remember you know that he went there 69 and he found them there and he lived there for six years and he left them there because they were determined to make something out of this useful land grant but as brother Brissett will say that the, the ethiopian world federation is not for rastafari it's for all black people it is not the preserve of Rastafari. It is for all black people. And until the people who regard themselves as people of Ethiopian descent, we can remember now, you know, earlier we spoke about Ethiopia as being the name for a vast area of the continent, not just present day Ethiopia. I want to mention the countries, it means that some of those some of our brothers and sisters who were enslaved come from some of those countries. So, you know, all of us somehow share umbilical Ethiopian heritage and not just the kind of metaphor of freedom and that it represents for most of us. So, the gentleman, brother, brother, Brissa, tell me that. When the charter was incorporated, there, there were 12 people, 11 men and one female. He said he himself was signatory to a section of the land grant. And so he is waiting for people to come on board. The local 43 is located at 5 Davison Crescent, Kingston 20. And it needs membership. Recently, we had a meeting with the, the council, the council that deals with benevolent societies. There is, a, there is an arm of the government that deals with benevolent societies. People need to know these things, you know. And so the Ethiopian World Federation now has registered with this arm of the government and this arm of the government has recognized that the ethiopian world federation the local 43 chapter needs its support and will get its support brother brissett and and brother davidson and all the other brethren who are there brother morris have a building and they are building a community center that will serve the community. The building is more than half finished. And right now the Benevolent Society will be, will be ensuring that the building is finished. And so they will fund the construction of, and the finish of the building. When the building is finished, they will also, also put machinery in there for us now to carry out the work of the Ethiopian World Federation. 
the charter that is given to us by his majesty to do this work for our community so the community will benefit it's going to be a feeding program and so every so every second sunday every two sundays we meet and we talk about our plans about how to make the ethiopian world federation function so you see how far we're coming from we're coming from when ethiopia was visited by greeks and gods from greece and when ethiopia defeat italy twice and go through all of his internal changes with with all of the intrigue and the power play between the different tribes the different nations in ethiopia who wanted to bring the the whole into one until many like the second came until his imperial majesty came and give jamaica a land grant in Sheshamani that still exists today that still has some serious reconfiguring to do because black people all over the world we need our own little renaissance you know to redirect us and make sure so we have more unity we need more unity so as the public relations officer for ewf local for the tree chapter because there were many locals operating in jamaica you know, but somehow they have gone out because probably lack of proper interest lack of proper promotion you know and so we need to ensure that that happened that it goes down so Sheshamani land grant still exists and it is it is not the bubble house that should administer it it is not the 12 tribes of israel that should administer it it is the ethiopian world federation that should administer it the Sheshaman the land grant was 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 made was given to be administered by the ethiopian world federation and that's what that's what we have to do the emperor granted lands in Sheshaman ethiopia in the name of the ethiopian world federation for people of african heritage in the diaspora desiring to return to the motherland with a promise to provide to provide more lands and so presently if the, the organization headquarters in the united states they are the ones who should be administering this land so everyone who want to return home and want to return specifically to ethiopia because remember you know there are other people who are going home through different ways but we are going we are going to listen to black Uru, natural mystic and hear them say before we forward out Hear from original black hole we, we hear mikey rose voice in a lot so we, we want encourage the one them to think on these things that are mentioned today you know and we, we do have no calling today and all but texting because this is very very potent 
very heavy, very dense stuff that we're trying to do. I'm on Black probably next next strong now will be trying to maybe ask the ones them to come and make some comments about what they said today. I have to want them all the why make a little one squeeze before we leave. <laughs> make two comments about some of the things you heard today. Because we you know what we want to encourage the one them to do. Get into the notion and the idea of more scholarship. When we say scholarship, we don't mean to get funding for God do university, but personal scholarship, man. Our ancestors did build pyramids, you know. Ethiopia build Egypt. Look how Egypt fantastic. And uh, Ethiopia build that. The inspiration. Till all uh, Ethiopian king who did rule Egypt too. Did promise and save all Jerusalem. In the Bible. Till all uh, Zeus and Poseidon used to go to Ethiopia. Go, go, go feast with gods till all the Greeks write extensively said no European country no country has been written about by Europeans as much as Ethiopia because Ethiopia is a nation of antiquity they say men originated there they never migrate to Ethiopia like a man migrate and go build America God that happening, you know. People people don't know that, don't. At sixteen ten them start some companies in America go build it. Wipe out the people them who did there originally. Put them on plantation and reservation. And sideline them up till this day. And go build it. A migrant nation as it is today. So Ethiopia has remained the focal point today of our discussion. And as I said before, we we segue into the local 43 and we, we, we want people to recognize the greatness of our Ethiopian people. We are going to mention the names of some great Ethiopian athletes that have made significant contribution. Sadly, we can't have our Ethiopian football in the World Cup still because, lad, they don't really have no powerful football team yet. But they played still, you know, and they were very impressive in the African Nations Cup. Yeah, man, they made reach far, and people were surprised to know that Ethiopia also not only have good runners. Gezaheni Abera, Bezanesh Bekele, Kenenisa Bekele, roll call this now, you know, great African runners. Amenash Belete. Waruko Bikila, Mezaret Defar, still running, Banesh Dego, Eje Yahoo Dibaba, Genzebe Dibaba, Tiranesh Dibaba, females, Haile Gabri Selassie, Yosefu Herosu, Benjamin Kibebe, Rekanesh Kedane, Theodore Gabri Selassie, Lenko Skiba, Yedenachu Tesema, Deratu Tulu, Italo Vasolo, Luciano Vasolo, Momo Walde, Milan Walde, Mengistu Worku, Miritus Yifta, Zohar Zemi, the Miro. These are some of the great African. Ethiopian specifically, Ethiopian runners who graced the world stage and gave much, much delight to those of us who love athletics like myself and almost all former sports, really. <laughs> but you know what? We have come full circle because we realize that Ethiopia will remain the focal point of our lives because it remains the focal point of Africa. And only until we start to work more assiduously to free our people of self-hate and bleaching. Because when one knows oneself, 
one is proud to look however you were made by the gods that you don't feel vexed with how you look and rationalize it that you want to look pretty like a coloring book or some empty kind of assertion of of self almost they have this philosophy they call atavistic where you are it's, it's almost that you are intrinsically inferior atavistic essentialism you know so Ethiopia remain the focus today tomorrow and many other days there were time when you used to see Ethiopian flags being sold all over the place by by people who want to do it four five three fourteen forty four styled fm number www.styledfm.com facebook style fm portland send some little feed forward man because we're not dealing with the other feed feed forward and make us see what you thought about the way this was presented not in the usual way but nevertheless away and as we say, ancient Ethiopia is still very much in our minds because out of ancient Ethiopia we get ancient Egypt. You can imagine that ancient Ethiopia get ancient Egypt. Seventy thousand years of history, as compared to six thousand years of history. That's serious thing, that you know, for your mind to grasp. If you want to grasp something of importance, that there's a long strand of history. That we, told, that we are told never existed. And regardless of what you want to think, you cannot deny the existence of this body of knowledge, of this great beacon of the world. Things have gone, the country has gone through different changes, you know. I mean, sometimes the most potent image in some people's mind is famine and desolation, but all of that sometimes is a symptom of our unwillingness to help and to improve our continent. We need to, as a people outside of the diaspora, be humble enough to offer help without thinking that we have all the answers. That, that's another thing, you know. You want to offer help, but you don't want to go with this, this all, almost Eurocentric ethnocentricity. Eurocentric ethnocentricity cloaked as Pan-African concern because sometimes the Pan-Africanist bigly says him have the solution for Africa's problem. When in fact his majesty gave us the the EWF, the Ethiopian World Federation. And Marcus Garvey gave us the UNIA with all its different focal points and its own weaknesses as well. So we are give thanks for the listenership out there. And we hope that the faithful have remained faithful tonight. Different voice, Osai Mwese, Osak Buru. We were there from the inception of metamorphosis, from the days that it was conceived, and the days that Ayman Black, with his resilience, has kept it going. Give thanks to Ayman Black, stalwart that he is, who has kept it going. You know, even by himself, just kept it going, so that I and I can come into there, come. Come share with the item. I love for Ethiopia. And I love for black people in general. And as a teacher, I love for youth. And I want to hear all my colleagues who are listening. Roxanne and all my son. Hey, and you listen, sir. And all the people them who listen and all the students who text me to say, Sir, we hear you on the radio. Your son, you sound all right. They never say all right still, but. So we want to give thanks to all the ones who have listened and we hope that we have enlightened your light. We hope that we have enlightened your light and not any other thing. So give thanks and Isis, give thanks and Isis as we go into a different section and play some more music. For the one them here. We're so forward again. Trees are singing, that's a single gun cultivated, 
A wicked young junior ray dreading at the mountain top with some serious guitar wheeling at the, the section. It's like a call. Someone was calling, yeah, well, we so forward again. Call forward again, Carla. But you know what? We want to give thanks for the, the idea that came into our head when I'm on black. Say, oh, sir, you willing for host a show? And I say, yes, man. Because as I said before, my philosophy in life is that nothing remains taught. We always have to say it again and again. And Ethiopia, you know, black people, we need to strengthen each other more in the earth. And sometimes when we see things happening, we have to strengthen each other up on the way to ensure that it doesn't fall apart. And sometimes I feel as though with blackness, if we don't mind sharp, we get kind of just diffused into thinking that it don't matter. Some people say it don't matter, it really don't matter. When in fact, because of who we are, if you're not strong economically and and philosophically, philosophically, you don't question things, you just accept everything. We have to start become we have to start become inventors of our own destiny. We have to start become inventors of our own destiny. Rather than sit down and make other people turn us into mass consumers. And then dictate for us what are the parameters of development. What is development and then decide for us how it should be. And then we just say, okay. And feel as though we can't invent anything. The, the, and as I said before, technology is even a very po a potent flashpoint. Where we are just, where is the Jamaican cell phone? We still, we still don't have... With a, some man try to manufacture a car. So what? Uh, we can't make a car in a Jamaica. We're cheaper than, than RD and Volkswagen. And so what? Uh, Having the name so you can't drive. We, 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 uh, them thing there as black people. When you consider that ancient Ethiopia used to be a place. I mean, I must have said, you know, we're Poseidon. Can you imagine? Poseidon and Zeus. However, however they're 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 venerated that's european the inhabitants worship zeus and Dionysus. for the people of coitus were evidently ethiopian and this i perceived for myself before i heard it from others so when i came to consider the matter i asked them both and the Cotians had remembrance of the Ethi of the egyptians more than the egyptians of the Cotians. but deep chan said that they believed that the Cotians were a portion of the army of Sestoris. So you see, and the men are taller, handsomer, and longer lived than anyone else. The Ethiopians were clothed in the skins of leopards and lions, and had long bows made of the stem of the palm leaf, not less than four cloths in length. On, or on these they laid short. So you see, we can't stop. Princes and kings shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall stretch for her hand unto God. And he says, when the south declined. So you see, we have so much things to say that we will have to come forward again next time to say. And they had, they conquered Arabia and they conquered Troy. Homer tells us that Ethiopians ruled Troy and Arabia. Few other nations are mentioned in ancient European literature as much as Ethiopia. And even fewer as highly esteemed. Ethiopians are the first mentioned in the oldest of Greek texts and it's called the Homer's Iliad as a place frequented by the Greek gods Homer states 12 for Jupiter's stay with the Ethiopians at whose return then petition Zeus is at the ocean river with Ethiopians feasting he and all the heaven dwellers and so we we don't conclude, you know. We know. <laughs> we don't conclude. Because we don't end knowledge. We don't conclude. We know. And, and a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from thence it was parted and became into four heads. And the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is, is it that compass it the whole land of Ethiopia. Which other country is mentioned so much in the Bible in these 
away. And when you look at Menelik again, as somebody who was one of the descendants of the Solomonic dynasty, of which His Majesty Emperor Selassie was also a descendant, of which Jesus the Christ was also a descendant, the place where the Ark of the Covenant is housed and kept in perpetuity. Although some people are still querying that, but where is it? Where is it? Where is the Ark of the Covenant? Where is it found? In which place is it housed? And so black people, we have to recognize Say so this is the time and the place to ensure that your Ethiopian knowledge is used to inspire you. Is used to inspire you. We want your one more tune used to inspire you purposefully. <laughs> I just want to share with you them one more thing about the local because this is sometimes now it says that any 25 persons or more desirous of forming a local shall apply to the executive council for a charter the executive council is in um, the u.s there's a fee to apply to the charter and right now in jamaica you know what the due is the dues is 100 dollars a month $100 a month, you know, now, anyway, that is something. The officers of the local shall be the president, the vice president, the second vice president, treasurer, recording correspondent, secretary, chaplain, sergeant of arms. And so enshrined in this constitution are all the necessary committees that you need to set up. What is beautiful though is that recently as i as i mentioned before is the fact that um the benevolent societies have recently crafted a new document that will ensure that our legal parameters now are established with the benevolent society so in addition to the constitution that is used to govern the the local chap chapter the local there's also the the framework now set up by the benevolent society to give us legal status within the benevolent society so that we can carry out the work that is required of us and that is given to us by his majesty to do so all the people out there who want to do serious community work this is your chance there's no better way. And all the people who, all the Rasta brethren who sit down and are degenerating, it's a serious thing that I'm saying, you know, need to come on board 
and be a part even if you don't be a part of local 43 there's a local in spanish town there was one in saint Anne. there was one in montego be revive them reapply to the headquarters in um, the united states pay your fees and revive the locals and start the more community work black people have suffered so much that we need to get more resources together and the resources are there the ewf is part of the united nations <laughs> it's part of the united nations you know so there are resources out there now for us to get once we organize and so that our people can benefit in a very serious and material way so everyone i hope the item learn something i hope the item get some ideas to work at i hope the item feel moved enough they can go visit and do some research wherever you are from wherever you are and since you have such access to technology and information go into one of the um one of the libraries online or check some of the journals online and do some research there are many history journals online that are free you can just go online and just open them there's a canadian journal it's like you are flipping the pages you can get national geographic online and you can read about you can get the 93rd is that national geographic with the coronation of his majesty you can get that one and look and see so good night once and all and i go in blessed and honor to have shared with the item we're going we're going Yes, we are golden. We are golden. 